The draft is just around the corner, and we're here to do some mock drafts on Mock Draft Monday. All that and more on this edition of the bullpen. The And welcome to the bullpen. I'm James Roy, and as always with me is Tom Chavaria. And boy, do we have, do we have a lot to talk about since the last time we did a mock draft Monday. It is you know the Texans have traded out of the first round. The Texans have uh, traded for Stephon Dix with what they did there. And there's just a lot going on, not only there but with the prospects that we like for the Texans. We're going to talk all all about that. But first, Tom, how are you doing today? Well, we've been Mock Draft Monday, Mock Draft Monday, and now it is Draft Month. So our Mock Draft Mondays, I feel, must be sharper because we are almost to the finish line. I think we're three weeks away. I'm really excited. I don't know what the Texans are going to do. I'd like to think I have an idea. We're definitely going to talk about it. I'm just ready to get there. I, I'm i with you. I mean, we've had plenty of time to practice since we, to some in some way, shape, or form, have been doing mock draft Monday or draft discussion pretty much since the day after the Super Bowl. So I, I mean, I, if there was ever a time for the episode to be at its sharpest, it should be during draft month. But before we get into that, let's let's have some brief discussions about some other things today. Today, Sunday. I, you know, I, as y'all know, we don't record on Monday because how else would you get this episode on Monday if we recorded it on Monday? But today. Devondre Sweat, DWI in Austin. Uh, what do you make of that? I, there's there's a couple angles to approach this from. The Texans, uh, but regardless of how you view things, I think the Texans should address defensive tackle, and I don't think I'm in the minority on that. Um, and Devondre Sweat's a name that's been thrown around. Um, D'Amico Ryan's constantly emphasizes person over player. Um, just knowing what you know about the Texans organization what do you make of this DWI and how it affects Tavondre Sweat's draft stock? I want to say it, it impacts it a great deal. I think the consensus around the league was that Tavondre Sweat was going to be, at minimum, a day two prospect. I, I think second, third round, you were going to see his name come off the board for sure. With this concern now, which... I don't think this is going to stop him from playing football. I don't think he's not going to be ready for training camp or anything like that. Just the idea that, okay, we're starting to have concerns about a player's focus, about a player, you know, his off the field things. Um, He could slide a peg. And if the Texans feel that it was a one-time affair, I think this now puts them more in play to take him or if the Texans feel, well, this is something we don't want to mess with, now that takes a D tackle off the board and they really have to figure out another way to address that position because I want to say the draft is pretty thin at D tackle. I mean, I think it pushes, so you can look at it one of two ways, right? And so I think um, looking at, so John Crumpler, who could be coming on the show sometime soon, we're working that out, but um, he, I think, put it best in that with with the defensive tackle position and and with scheme fit concerns you already had so many teams that weren't going to take Tavondre Sweat uh Tavondre Sweat jeez uh because of scheme fit and so now you you narrow that list even more by teams that are like oh DWI I'm out so i the people are saying the slide won't be significant but i think all of that depends on which teams are out on him and where they fit in the draft because I think that has a huge impact. But w- one way it goes is either everyone goes, oh, cool, a young player gets a DWI right before the draft. What else is new? Uh, bring me the fastest 300 plus pound guy I've ever seen in my life to fill <laughs> you know the gap. You know, I I'm all for it. I mean, I personally, I I think that the Texans could get a steal on him now. Um, and I think if he's on the board at 59 and you haven't made the move for a defensive tackle that that's the way you go. Um, I don't think you let him get out of the second round either way, but I mean, I could, like I said, person over player, maybe D'Amico um, is, is whispering in Nick's ear, like, Hey, that's that we're out on sweat. Um, but if that's the case that the other way this goes, 
is the Texans would have to emphasize either taking at 42 or moving up, depending on how the draft shapes out, to get a defensive tackle prospect like a Braden Fisk or um, a Johnny Newton, I believe is the guy from Illinois. Um, I believe that's what he wants to be called because I don't remember what, I think it's Jerzon is actually his name. Um, but so this, I think, has major implications on the Texans draft. But as is the case in most you know, businesses that are like the NFL, the Texans aren't really going to know how to approach until they see how the draft plays out. So I, I think it leaves a lot of nuance. Um, and, and I think it really removes any ability to guess what the Texans are going to do that day, unless something comes of this investigation that, that would lead anyone to believe that that sweat might not be available week one or that he might not play. Um, if, if it's viewed that he'll be available week one, I I think that he goes per, still in the second round, maybe the third round. Third round is the furthest I could see him slip. But looking at other things that are affecting the Texans draft, um, the trade for Stephon Diggs is huge. As as y'all know, if you're a, a loyal listener to the bullpen, Tom took Keon Coleman with the first pick in his mock draft every single time that we conducted one, as far as I remember. Um, I cannot remember one where he was available when you didn't take him. So we'll see. I think that with the Stefan Diggs situation, my big question for you is, is with eliminating the last three years of the deal and Stefan Diggs being on a prove it year, um, do you, do you view it this as a situation where the Texans could still draft a receiver high to, to hold and develop? And then if, and when I think it's highly likely I don't see very many situations where Stephon Diggs performs and stays on the roster. Um, but with that in mind, do you think that it's it's still likely they go right wide receiver high in the draft? I think that really depends on what you think of Xavier Hutchinson, of John Mechie, and where they fit in all of this. If those are the guys that they still feel that they can develop, then I can't see the logic in drafting another wide receiver the last show we did, we talked about the depth that they have at wide receiver with Robert Woods still being on there with Sims. They picked up. I mean, you're just, you're, you're running out of places to put guys. So for me, I think if those guys are not in the card long term, then absolutely you need to address wide receiver because there is a scenario, an unlikely scenario, but a scenario where you could be after this season without uh, Stefan Diggs and without Nico Collins. Both of those guys could command serious dollars that another team could give them that the Texans may not want to invest in a wide receiver. I see it being unlikely that both of those guys get out of town, but <clears throat> stranger things. So I really think that while I don't see them going high for a wide receiver, I think that there is still a chance, based on the fact that they did this contract the way they did, for the Texans to still take a wide receiver at some point to develop um, somebody that slides, you know, something like that, maybe the second second round pick or, or something. I don't think it'll be their first selection, but I do think there is potential for them to take a a uh, wide receiver that graded higher for them that is still available at a later pick. I think in my mind, the third round is the earliest that we see them go unless like, say, I don't know, like a Brian Thomas or Keon Coleman, like slips really far into the second round. Then you might see them, I don't know, move up from, from 59 or if he's at 59, take him. Um, but I, I do agree. So we're looking, I mean, even if you assume the Texans cut Robert Woods by and draft a wide receiver, right? You still have Hutchinson and Mechie, um, and and I don't think the Texans are ready to to move on from Mechie. I think they still want to see him realize his potential, uh, which which really should take them out of the wide receiver market in general. Um, maybe they're hoping Diggs can bridge the gap while Mechie figures it out. Um, not not saying they're comparable players, but just saying that maybe they're looking for someone to step into that wide receiver four, wide receiver three role. Um, and in the meantime, they're just going to have digs there. Um, I really, I don't really know what to make of, of that. I mean, either way, those last three years of the deal outside of like very little guaranteed money in the 2025 year, um, were all t like team player options kind of things going on. Like there was no guaranteed money and there was no reason to believe the Texans would keep him if he didn't perform. And there's no reason to believe that Stefan Diggs would want to play on that deal if he overperformed. So it was, I think it was just a mutually beneficial decision to 
uh, kind of shave that, do what already was going to happen anyways and just set it up to be a motivated, you know, get after it this year kind of thing. Um, but I mean, I, I, like I said, I think third round, if, if Malachi Corley or like someone who they think could, they could develop, you know, is there, I, we, we did, like you said, we discussed this last week. I think the most likely scenario they draft a wide receiver is if they see a guy late in the draft that handled kick return duties and was really good with the new kick return rules. If they want to get, you know, draft someone late to challenge Steven Sims. Uh, but outside of that, I don't, I don't really see them going wide receiver early. Um, but looking one more thing to talk about before we actually get into our mock drafts. I know you've been waiting 15, 10, 15 minutes for us to do mock drafts. I know you guys are waiting with bated breath, but, um, I was asked on Instagram and I briefly brought it up to Tom, but I didn't really let him in on my answer on my Instagram story, but, uh, Texans players in fantasy, since it's technically a draft that you would expect to come off the board first. Um, who do you think it is? Who do you think that will be the most common pick first off the board from the Texans in a fantasy draft this, this spring, this fall, summer? As a guy that plays a lot of fantasy sports, for me, I think it's going to be one of two guys. And I think it's going to be Joe Mixon or it's going to be um, CJ Stroud. For me, I, I don't see any scenario where one of the wide receivers comes off the board before those two for the simple fact that CJ Stroud could have now realistic second round draft value as like one of the top three or four quarterbacks. And then when you talk about fantasy sports, running backs are impossible. You never have enough. You never have enough. And I, I, you know, once a run on running backs goes, then it's like everybody's just scratching and clawing for running backs. Where wide receivers, you can find a guy somewhere that will produce week to week to week. Some people stream them. Um, so for me, I wouldn't, if I'm drafting, I'm taking one of those two guys before I take any wide receiver, in part because I feel like they're going to cancel each other out. You're not. There's, there's a chance that neither of them hit like a ceiling of a third round or a fourth round wide receiver because they're, the ball is going to be so spread out. Yeah, I mean, so I didn't even, when I answered the question, I didn't even think about it. I mentioned CJ as a, a, the clear super flex first off the board, um, but I didn't even think about Joe Mixon. I, I shouldn't say I didn't think about him. I just didn't really list him as an option. I feel like I feel like public perception on, on Joe Mixon is going to, so, because there's some people that that don't believe he's basically, I may be a little biased here, but he's basically in the same situation that he was in, in in Cincinnati in terms of having three great wide receivers that create the lightest boxes that you could ever see. You know, all he's gonna have to do is hope the offensive line is half, like 150 percent better than they were last year, uh, just like improved to the level that we believe they can play, not even exceptionally above that. Um, and then he just has to play Joe Mixon ball with a light box and he'll probably get his. So, I mean, I could believe his value might be high in, in some people's eyes if they, if they are high on the Texans receiving core. Um, but I, I think I could steal him in the third round if I, if I'm being honest, even if, even though he's a starting running back, but I mean, I could be wrong. That's just about where I, where I see him going. So I, I think it's between the wide receivers. I think it's between Diggs, Nico and, and Tank. I think that the public perception of Nico and Tank is lower than it should be. And so I think that Stephon Diggs is the first player off the board for the Texans. He was be drafting in the first round last year um, in a lot of the leagues that I was in. Um, but also, I, I agree with your point. But to, to that point, I would say that I'm cautious to call. I, I think the safest thing to say is 1A, 1B, 1C. But when we're when we're really getting down to it, and we're trying to like make the depth chart for the Texans, um, I, I'm not sold on Stephon Diggs as wide receiver one for the Texans in that situation. I think that it, you talk about build, you talk about usage, and you talk about a number of things. But just just from my perspective, I view I still view Nico Collins as the wide receiver one. Um, it, it's more politically correct to say one A, one B, one C. There are some people that'll tell you Tank is the wide receiver one, and and I love Tank, and I think he's going to eat. But I, I don't know if I, I think he's clearly in the two-three conversation per personally. 
there's not a slight to him. There's just a lot of talent in that room. But I, I can say based based on just because and it was a thought process that was put out this offseason and it's not popular as far as I know. But the injury to Tank Dell gave CJ Stroud and Nico Collins the time to develop the chemistry that makes me confident in saying that. If if Tank Dell doesn't get injured last year, I'm I'm t- Stephon Diggs is wide receiver one easy. But because they had that time to develop chemistry, I I'd go with Nico Collins as wide receiver one. And I think that he should be the first one off the board, but I think it's going to be Stephon Diggs in most fantasy drafts just because of the reputation that precedes him and general trends. But yeah, I mean, I don't know. Do you have anything to say that I usually try and move on to the next topic, but do you have anything to say to what I just said? So for me, I am approaching this upcoming draft because I'm I'm already in a couple leagues and um, I'm approaching it with whoever is the last one available is the one I want because I feel like their numbers, all three of them are going to be so similar that if you drafted the other two ahead of the whoever you get last, you probably did it wrong. There was a player that you could have got at that spot that's probably going to perform better than the value that you're going to get in the fifth round, I guess, drafting Tank Dell if Nico and uh, Stefan Diggs go in the third and fourth round. You know what I mean? I, I buy it. Yeah, 100%. I, I feel like with the Texans, especially with the rapport that I feel that CJ has built with all of them, he's going to make a concerted effort to feed the ball evenly distribute it fairly i don't think tank's gonna go without if stefan is is starts off hot i don't think nico is gonna go without if tank gets going i think cj is gonna make sure that everyone gets a bite of the apple and that's gonna deter from all three of them shooting to the moon i don't think you're gonna get like a a, like a like a a waddle situation with uh with uh, Hill, where you can take both of them. I think one of them, you know you know what I mean? Like, because their offense is so tailored to those two guys, you can take both of them early and feel good about it. Where I think you want to wait for the Texan wide receiver that is the least picked, if that makes sense. It does. I mean, the last thing I'll say on it, um, I have a cool fantasy story, but I, I, I really want to say this. Um, CJ Stroud, 4,200 passing yards last year. If we look at the breakdown of targets and who all those yards went to, you can either view it one, you know, one of three ways. Either CJ takes a, takes a step back, maybe throws for 3,800 yards. That means that there's at least one or two wide receivers that pulls 1,000 yards. So it, you're playing Russian roulette, except for you really you could hit on two because Dalton Schultz is probably good for five to 600. And then maybe one of the wide receivers that's not the top three hits like five or 600. And then the rest of that goes to the top three. So... Uh, but if you view that C.J. Stroud takes a step forward and that his rookie season was a building block and that he has not reached his potential, which most people would say is probably the case, then you look at him maybe jumping up to like 4,500 yards, maybe inching closer to, to 5,000. And when you throw for the, those numbers, you probably get two, maybe three of those wide receivers with 1,000 yards, unless there's an injury. So I, I don't think, I don't know if I necessarily agree. I see what you're saying and I see it from the perspective that there's not a clear cut like this guy's going to eat and he's going to get 1500 yards and 20 touchdowns or whatever. Like, I think that you'd be fine waiting to take the last one of the three. So I, I agree with you to that point. Um, speaking of taking the last one or, you know, whatever I'm in a keeper league and in, in a sheer stroke of, of genius, some might say, some might call it Homerism and it's probably that, um, the way the league works is, is that when you draft as, as is typical, but I'll explain it for anyone who doesn't know, um, when you draft a player, you get to pick two players to keep the next season. And in this league, you, you technically just draft them with the pick in front of them. Or if they're, if you picked them up off waivers or in free agency, I think it's like an eighth round pick you give up. Um, in the 16th and 17th round, which were the last two rounds of the draft, I took these two players. I took CJ Stroud in the 16th round. And I took Tank Dell in the 17th, which means that this next season, I will be drafting CJ Stroud in the 15th round, and I will be drafting Tank Dell in the 16th round of the draft. So that's my my victory that definitely could have just blown up in my face, but I was like, I, there's no risk here. I'll just take these two with the last two picks, 
and it's gonna it is gonna feed families next season when I take the championship because I got two of the best players in the draft at the end of the draft. So that's that's that from me. But let's move into the the mock draft portion of mock draft Monday. For those of you who are un, unfamiliar, um, we're, I'm going to be using visual aids. So if you're watching on YouTube, you'll see it. If you're not, we're going to try our best to to speak it out and let you know what's going on. Um, Tom and I each have our own mock drafts up through NFL Draft Buzz. We're going to take turns taking picks. Um, and then at the end, we'll, we'll look at what we got. And I don't know, last time we did this, I hated my mock draft. So I've posted some, I think, some pretty solid mock drafts on Twitter but every time we get under the the bright lights of of this podcast, I I just I turn into the worst GM in the league. Like think uh, I don't know Chris Ballard, that the Colts GM. I'm trying or Trent Baalke, the Jag. I'm I'm trying to think of like literally any other GM in the AFC South. <laughs> yeah, that's who I become. Thinking that like I'm done with the rebuild and dropping a hundred mil when I really I'm like not done with the rebuild. But anyways, I'm done rambling. I'm gonna go ahead and throw my mock draft on the board. Uh, set it off, get it started. Um, and let's see what we got. Okay, wow. Those look like a bunch of names I've never seen before. My goodness. What is going on? Maybe I need to reset it. Good grief. I should have started it before we got on, but that's okay, guys. Don't worry. We all make mistakes. Um, now I'll enter the draft. Good grief. Um... Let's go. There it is. Those are names that I recognize, and they're all wide receivers. Why is why is the Texans trade for Stephon Diggs in the first time up? I'm like, um, yeah, sure, I'll take. It. Okay, I think I know what I'm going to do here. But before I do that, the names that are showing up that I like are safeties and corners. Um, you got Tyler Newbin, safety out of Minnesota, and Kamari Lasseter, cornerback out of Georgia. Um, I posted a reel a while back, and it it was talking about how. Derek Stingley had a, a statement second half of the season. Um, and just the other day, it was yesterday, actually, I believe, um, Kamari Lasseter, top 10 cornerback prospect in the draft, um, liked that reel. So maybe he likes what he sees. Maybe he wants to play across from Derek Stingley. I'll tell, I, I mean, I'd have him unless, I mean, we're, I don't know. There's been a lot of talk from from a lot of fans all over about bringing Steven Nelson back. I don't know where the Texans are with that. I have no information. Um, I would say between safety and corner that I think corner is better covered. And so I feel, but I also feel like it's kind of a lot to drop a, for the 42nd pick on depth. Whereas the guy that we pick at corner probably will start. Um, I tell you, I'm making a graphic to put out later and I'm waiting to do it because of the way the defense needs to shape up. Um, it is, it is not in as good of a spot as I probably thought it was earlier in the season. I trust that the draft will fix it, but um, I'm probably going to go, this is a tough try. I'm going to go Kamari Lassiter. I'm going to go ahead and, and do it. So let's put, let's put Tom's draft board on there. Tom, do you have anything to say about what I picked or do you just want to get right into yours? I mean, I've got no issue with who you picked. I think that's a great pick. Um, however, I just feel like they made a concerted effort to go out and get corners to go opposite of uh, – oh, I'm so bad with names tonight. <laughs> I, I just Derek feel like – Exactly. Thank you. They, they, they went out and got Jeff Okuda. They went out and got uh, C.J. Henderson. And I just feel like one of those guys is going to end up being – the dude out of camp that they're going to ride with. And maybe they draft a corner, but I don't think it'll be with their first pick. I see them much more likely to do what I have on my board. So I have uh, Jared verse an edge rusher, which I think they could go that route. Uh, I, the, the linebacker Alabama route screams uh, Miko right there. Chris Braswell. I could see that. Yeah. Um, linebacker, I think, is an area of need for this team. And then here's that guy, Tavondre Sweat. They could say, DUI be damned. This is the guy we need. And if we've got to Uber him to and fro, then we will. <laughs> <laughs> Jeez. Um, why, why can't you drive yourself to practice? Oh. Right. <laughs> but for me, I think I'm going to take the linebacker. I, I like the idea of, of getting a linebacker here. 
Um, if you can't get the safety, I don't have the safety. Uh, so a, a linebacker, I think, is going to be something that's going to be looked at because they've got Henry Totoa. They've got uh, – oof, I'm bad at names again. Chris, right? Who's the other who's the other Alabama linebacker that we have? Chris Harris. Christian Harris. Chris, Christian Harris. They have those two guys. And I and I and I think not a whole lot else to go with them. I know they got some guys that can swing, but I feel that maybe, just maybe, that's that's something that they go. I know Edrin Cooper is the sexy pick. I'm not a big fan on AM guys because of the last AM guy we took. So I'm gonna avoid Texas AM in my draft. Okay. All right. I mean more power to you. I so I'll put mine up. We already made your pick. Um I just looked I probably should look closer because I really like linebacker at that pick too, and I probably Edrin Cooper was available and I just didn't look deep enough to find him. Um and I just went cornerback instead. And so I'm it's probably gonna come back to bite me, but we'll see. Um there is what? linebackers available at this point. You're gonna pick. hate I'm, your draft again, is what you're saying? I yeah, I just cause I I, I rushed it, I feel like. Um, but I mean, there's only so much time on the clock. Um, let's see, I don't think Peyton Wilson's a realistic pick at 59. So I, I'm probably going to go past that. Um, I also think I kind of like, I, I don't want to say I like Jeremiah Trotter better, but if I'm looking between the two, I think I'll, I think I'll, so I'm going to go linebacker with this pick. Oh goodness. My mouse is being all weird. Um, I'm going to go linebacker with this pick and I'm going to take Jeremiah Trotter at 59 to try and right my wrongs a little bit. Um, and to, to be fair, in your draft, Tavondre Sweat was available. In my draft, um, Tavondre Sweat and Braden Fisk both went top 40. Like So I would, unless I traded up, I would have had no uh, way to get them. So I'll lock it in, Jer- Jeremiah Trotter. Um, geez. And then, oh no, did I accept a trade? No, you didn't. You're good. Oh, okay. No, I did. Oh, now I have to reset my draft. <laughs> That's unfortunate. I was just trying. Anyway, right, also, the we, oh, right the wrongs. Right the wrongs. I know, right? Um, while I'm doing that, Tom, your draft is up. Go ahead. And make I, I'm ter- I'm terribly torn because Keon Coleman staring me in the face. I went and got my linebacker. Keon Coleman staring me in the face. Jonathan Brooks staring me in the face. As a Longhorn fan, I can totally. Keon Coleman at 59. Geez. I I know, right? That that. That's the kind of move where I would love for the Texans to take him. And I'm going to draft him, and I'm going to say that they just took the best available player. They filled the need off off rip and got a dude who I think would have graded out fine at 42. Now you've got a guy at 59 that is the 43rd-ranked player, and you're just going, I don't care that I've got five wide receivers. I'm going to take this dude, and I'm going to develop him. And and then then I can let Robert Woods go, or I could let uh, you know, uh, maybe they let X go and say this is the guy. You know what I mean? Maybe X ends up on the practice squad, something like that. There are some other picks here. Edron Cooper is still available here for me at fifty nine. So if they thought, hey, I can go Braswell, who can play edge and linebacker, and then I can go Edron Cooper and double up and just shore that up. That's an opportunity for them if they really love him. Xavier Worthy still on my board, which is crazy to me because he's the fastest man on the planet right now. Um, the best D tackle would be Rook Ohoro. I can't even. I don't even know if I said that right. From Clemson, which is a Power Five school, I could see you know maybe they 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 take a leap there. But Casario seems like the guy. Like he's not gonna he's not gonna reach for anybody. I think that if anything, he would trade back if he thought there wasn't something he really liked at that position. But I'm going to lock in Keon Coleman. I know it's going to sound a little dumb, uh, but I love the idea of taking the best available player, and I'm going to draft as such. All right. Oh, yeah. Um, I mean, I, like, like we said earlier, I think that's a little bit early, but I, I don't think that the Texans would are 100% against taking one and I mean, if it's best player available, it's best player available. So I'm going to go put mine up. I, I went through and I just did the same picks. There was better picks available on this run through that I could have done. I could have had Edrin Cooper in the second round or in at the second pick in 59. I, I just put Trotter again because I didn't want to, you know, 
I already I've made my bed. I'm going to lie in it. <laughs> so just just because they gave me an out doesn't mean I'm going to take it. Um, there's a couple of intriguing options. In Max Melton is a cornerback the Texans I believe have interviewed. Um, Blake Corum and Trey Benson are two running backs that could definitely um, be useful. I know the Texans have interviewed Trey Benson at the very least. Um, I'm less into into Blake Corum after the move for Joe Mixon because I, I I view J- Blake uh, Corum as a guy who could probably contend for a starting job. Um, I don't I don't know if he'd win it, but I mean I think that he he's got to go to a better spot than Houston for for where he's at. So I wouldn't want to do that to him personally. And then there's Javon Baker, who is the only player, as far as I know, it could have changed since I last looked at it, that the Texans both had a top 30 visit with and interviewed at the Combine. So I think that maybe that ship has sailed. I might wait a little longer to go wide receiver. Um, With that, I think I'm going to go Mac. Or no, I already did corner. Dang it. Um, I'll... Oh, Bucky Irvin sounds so good too. This is why I, as soon as I'm in the bright lights, like I just become, I'm like so indecisive, can't figure it out. That's why I could never be the Texans GM. I never, I never claimed to be, but um, I, I think I'm gonna go Trey Benson. I think that ah no, the second or no, this is the third round pick. Sorry, yeah, Trey Benson in third sounds good. Give the Texans a running back that can kind of uh maybe maybe take over for Damian Pierce. I think the Texans view Damian Pierce as RB2 right now. So I don't think that I think it would take a lot for running back to overtake him, but I'm going to go I'm going to go ahead and do it. All right, let's see. I'm going to bring Tom back up. Tom, what do you got going on for your third round pick? So, I've got uh Jalen Polk, a wide receiver out of Washington. I clearly I've already addressed wide receiver. There's no chance. I, looking back at my pick of Keon Coleman, if Keon Coleman's there at that pick, I feel like a hundred percent in that scenario, based on what you said, the Texans trade back, acquire more draft capital. Somebody jumps up to get Keon Coleman and then they add another fifth round or fourth round or some jazz like that. I feel like that's what would happen. Or, or maybe they get a second round next year, something like that. If Keon Coleman's available at that spot, Trey Benson's here, but I don't think they take running back early, this early. I think their running back that they would take would be something later because you're talking about RB3 where you could still probably get somebody that could be uh, in your rotation. I've got two safeties here, and I feel like safety has been a hot-button topic. Obviously, they've got Jalen Petrie. Obviously, they got Jimmy Ward. But there isn't anything else that I can think of really of note. So for me – Jaden Hicks is ranked just ahead of Dorian Taylor Emer- Dem- Demerson. I think that's how you say that. I feel like Washington State is going to play a little bit more defense than Texas Tech. Just, just, just totally on conference base, and I think that's going to be my pick. I'm going to take Jaden Hicks. If they're close, I'd rather go with this guy from Washington State. I contemplated think- him. He, he was on my board at that point too. Let's see. All right, I'm gonna bring up mine. Um, I do like this. I, I so I, I said that the Texans realistically, and it's it sounds like an obvious statement, and it basically covers the entire defensive side of the roster. But I've I've said recently the Texans really need to address corner, linebacker, and safety, um, and defensive tackle. And looking at the picks that I've used, I've addressed linebacker and corner. I've yet to address safety or defensive tackle. Um, so those are basically places I'd like to go with it. I'm kind of regretting going running back in the third because Braylon Allen's here in the, in the fourth and I'd probably rather take him. Um, if I'm looking at it, I'm thinking, uh, I'm thinking I'd go Leonard Taylor defensive tackle out of Miami, but I need to look at his profile cause I don't know if he's actually a scheme fit and I don't want to put someone who's not a scheme fit. Nose tackle, defensive tackle. That's not boding well for this pick. Um, let's see. Looking down. Let's see. Um, I ah, let's see. I don't know if it says what his. It's just talking about his skill level. It's not, but it says nose tackle slash defensive tackle. I'm thinking that's indicative of him not really being a scheme fit. I could be wrong there, but I don't have enough information to uh, 
roll on that. So I'll probably look. I'll probably look to go tight end. Honestly, I know that I said that safety is a need, but if I'm looking at DB, I, I don't see a safety coming up anywhere near the or probably not till the next round. So I'd probably go later in the draft, like maybe a Tyke Smith um, or something like that. But for now, as as Tom and I have said throughout the offseason, the Texans are kind of in a best player available position, but corner is already a rich position. They've already addressed running back. Not sure about the fit of the defensive lineman available. And that leaves a tackle and a tight end, and I'm, I'm going to go tight end. I, I think that Ben Sinat um, is a good pickup to kind of slowly develop into a, a, a guy at tight end. So I'm going to go with him. And then we'll, we'll throw it back to you, Tom. All right, so... Caught you looking at draft profiles, I see. Let me go back so I can show you what I'm looking at. So right now I've got Kalen Carson... Uh, Mason Smith, Elijah Jones, Javon Foster, Josh Newton, and James Williams right now on my board. Uh, D-tackle is something we've talked about a lot. This is a position of need. Uh, definitely something I think they will address in the draft at some point. Uh, LSU, Power 5 school, known for their defenses. Mason Smith is here. So that's the profile you caught me peeking. I was trying to see if he's a fit because he's fallen a little bit. He's the 111th ranked guy right now. We're at pick 123. So why is this guy sliding a little bit based on where a lot of guys or this this has him ranked? Pulled up the profile. Uh, sophomore, 6'5", 306. Uh, probably pretty good size for the position. He's an 83.3 player rating, which I do like. Um, same thing, uh, no tackle, defensive tackle. So we, we got to looking at his strengths real quick. He made this freak list, Bruce Feldman's freak list, ranked number 12. So the former five-star recruit is one of the most gifted players in college football. Love to hear that. Athleticism is something you cannot coach. Uh, weaknesses, though, missed significant playtime due to injuries, raising durability concerns. I could see where that would be, why he slipped. Uh, maybe a spot where, you know, Miko says, hey, this is a guy that I think I can I can uh, school a little bit, maybe work with his technique, you know, keep him, keep him, you know, in good position, maybe not get nicked up so much. Maybe they saw a combine that they liked. Uh, the summary that I was reading, which I thought was really intriguing as far as a player that the Texans could target, Mason Smith enters the draft with a unique blend of size and strength and athleticism that makes him a potential asset on any defensive front. Something like that screams um, a player that the Texans could look at. So for me, I'm going to take a shot on Mason Smith in the fourth round. All right, sweet. Um, let me throw mine up there. And we got one more pick. And honestly, I don't know. I feel like I'm reaching for any of the players that I <laughs> want to get. I set myself I, – I told you at the beginning that this is going to be the case, but I have really just not set myself up very well. I knew I probably should have held off on going um, – what's it called? Going, you know – linebacker or I should have held off on running back but here I am once again I'm torn into pieces um as Kelly Clarkson would say and so I man I feel like ah oh, and the t and Christian Jones came off the board the pick before I feel like tackle might be a place to go for depth at this pick so I I be between tackle or adding a wide receiver like an and an um Ananias Smith uh, someone, you know, or a Luke McCafferty, Jake Counting, something like that. Um, other than that, like, I don't really, I don't really know what I'm supposed to do with this pick. So I'm just going to go tackle because I already hate this draft anyway. So um, let's just go with Matt Goncal Goncalves out of Pitt. And that is the first time, if you will, uh, at least on Mock Draft Monday, that I've thrown a tackle into my mix. So, I I and don't worry, you don't have to hate me for it because I already hate me for it. Um, but 
Let's get Tom's last pick. His draft, I think, is shaping up a little better than mine is. All right. So, as you can see, we still have Kayleen Carson on the board, Elijah Jones on the board, Josh Newton on the board, James Williams, Johnny Wilson. And I, the name that I was looking at, the, the guy you caught me checking their profile again, Isaac Garendo. Texans and, just recently had a top 30 visit with him. Exactly, exactly, which I find interesting. I don't think they waste those. I feel like if, they, if they've if got him in for a top 30, there's a good chance they're, they're targeting them. This is a guy, he's ranked 128. They're at pick 127. It lines up perfectly where they want to be. Uh, dude's got explosive speed. He's a 4-3-3 guy. Um, he went from Wisconsin to Louisville, so – Came from a power five school. Uh, a lot of this stuff screams, you know, just just didn't get an opportunity. I think this is a perfect uh, spot to maybe draft a guy with uh, upside uh, in the run game. So looking at it, looking at the summary here, uh, marked by a transition from Wisconsin to Louisville, underlines a player with the capacity to adjust and thrive under very offensive schemes again another thing that screams bobby slowick screams what d'amico is trying to do uh impressive physical attributes and skill set i mean i like the sound of that that's going to be my pick all right well with that we have both made our drafts i don't want to recount mine i don't like it but (laughs) i I mean i will um kamari lassiter cornerback uh, Jeremiah Trotter, linebacker in the second round. And then in the third round, I got Trey Benson out of Florida State, running back. And I got a tight end and an offensive tackle in the fourth. Just, I I mean, I feel like the Texans are in prime position. Here, I'm going to go ahead and, and, and take down the – I'm going to shift this back to the normal format. I don't oh, you don't, you don't, you, you don't want to look at mine? <laughs> okay, I'll put yours up there. Okay, let's take a look at yours. Um, I just feel like the Texans – have the like I said, there's like four needs on defense that they can very easily address with the first four picks, um, depending, or maybe the first three picks, and then I, I I think adding a safety and free agency is the last move that we should expect from them, um, either before or after the draft, and I think that they can they can add a corner, a linebacker, and a defensive tackle in the first you know in the in the second and third round that will contribute as depth pieces on this team. So I'm frustrated that I failed to do that. But Tom, <laughs> go ahead and, and let's recount yours. So for me, it's a little bit more balanced than I thought I would come out. I feel like if I'm you know, trying to peek into D'Amico Ryan's and, and Nick Casario's head, this is going to be a defensive heavy draft in my mind. I think you're going to see them take a lot of defensive players and because the offense is pretty much settled with the exception of – a RB three, which I mean, those, those can be undrafted guys. You don't have to waste a draft pick there if you don't want to. Keon Coleman was a splurge. It was the ability to take the best available player and not be concerned with having to fill a hole that they have so very few of. Uh, I, I think right out the gate, we got a linebacker that I think coming from Alabama with an Alabama coach, with other Alabama linebackers, that they're just going to gel so well together. It feels like a really good, sexy pick right there. I think it's 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 something smart. I don't know if he'll be available, but I could totally see them making that pick at 42. Jaden Hicks is the safety that you're talking about. They went out and got to be able to groom in the third round. They've had really good success with third-round picks. And I think this could be another one, somebody that could slide into Jalen Petrie's spot or Jimmy Ward's spot. And I think that would work great. D-tackle is something that we feel like they have to address at some point. Mason Smith's there in the fourth round. This is a guy that probably would have went higher if he didn't have injury concerns and something that I think the Texans will be able to say, look, we can afford to take that shot. We can afford to gamble a little bit because of the the great shape that the rest of our defense is in. And then for me, a fourth round pick on a guy that they're bringing in for a top 30 pick, somebody that they're clearly already intrigued by in Isaac Gurendo. I hope I'm saying that right because if he's a Texan, I'm going to need to learn it. So uh, I think that could be potential there. Somebody that could start out on the special teams unit or maybe be, you know, 
a, a sub fullback guy. I, saw, I read that he was a blocker, so that could help too. And um, we'll see. But I but I love if if this is what they come out with, I'm I'm not mad. All right. Well, I you know I guess we'll get into final thoughts as everyone knows. Um, personally, as we get closer to the draft, I, I said it. I think that with the first three picks, they can easily address you know a lot of these positions they need to address on defense are not starters you know Aziz El Shazir Al Shair and um and Christian Harris are, are starters they they just need another rotation linebacker that is of that caliber along with Henry Toa Toa in order to breed depth into that lineup um as far as corner goes I this reclamation project they've overtake uh, undertaken with Jeff Okuda and and CJ Henderson um, if it works out, means they probably don't have to address corner in the draft. But it'd be nice to have a young piece, um, just that's more—I don't want to say more of a sure thing, but someone who can who can squeeze into the rotation and will have the the opportunity to develop if everything else pans out the way it should. Um, and then running back, I think, is a need that could be addressed after that. After you get those first three DT, um, I think DT honestly is one that you could get a starting level player at. It's just a rotational position, but if you go and you get a guy who can play the first two downs, like a Tavondre Sweat or like a a Braden Fisk, um, then then that's a win in my eyes. But I think that with with that, it's those four positions on defense and running back are really the last things with that. They're all depth, but they're the last things that need to be addressed. And that's those are my final thoughts. Tom, any final thoughts from you? I say it all the time. I'm gonna keep saying it until we get there. I need the draft tomorrow. I need the season to start the day after. I'm ready. I, I think you said it. You hit it perfectly. I totally agree with everything you said. I think it makes a lot of sense. I'm really excited to see what they end up doing. Um, clearly, all the moves that they've made so far in the offseason, in our opinion, I think, are are excellent moves to make this team very competitive. I love all the national press that the Houston Texans are get, getting as far as you know being respected and just respecting the over the, the 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 turnaround that happened in two years and how fast and where they were to where they are now, I think it's clear that Nick Casario is doing everything in his power to maximize this window that he has with a rookie contract for C.J. Stroud. And it's an exciting time in Houston for football. And everybody knows that in the state of Texas, while, yes, our Astros are great, yes, when the Rockets are good, they're great, even when the Dynamo are good, we love that. Football's king in Texas, man. I don't care what anybody says. I, I get it. You know, there there are certain people that are like, oh well, I don't, I don't, I don't subscribe to that. Well, you're in the minority in Texas. So, and I love. The last thing I'll say is I love that people are saying that Houston Texans are Texas's football team. That's crazy to me. Like, never in a million years would I think they'd be to that point where Dallas is no longer seen as the preeminent football team in Texas. Well, let's hope that CJ keeps it that way. I mean, I did. So I spoke to it earlier about Stefan Diggs and how I, I briefly, I'll speak to it. I, I don't think it's likely he comes back because either he underperforms and the Texans don't want him back or he overperforms and the Texans don't want to pay that kind of money for him. So the odds based on the way the deal came, it's looking like a second round pick was paid for a rental, which is a little disappointing but I'm still I still like the deal. It, it it shows the Texans are looking to get after a Super Bowl now. They're making the moves to try and do everything they can to win one before they have to pay CJ. Um, but I mean, ideally the Texans play so well, and and CJ and Stephon get along so well that one you know, all this narrative about Stephon Diggs being a locker cancer locker room cancer. Yeah, let's get rid of that right now. And two. You know, maybe Stefan Dick says, you know, I'll take a pay cut to come back and play here because like I you know, I'm over thirty. Um, I'm still a really good wide receiver, but I'm down to I'm down to be a part of what's going on here in Houston. To me, that's ideal outcome, hundred percent. So let's make that happen. I mean, I don't know. I don't I think there's a scenario where he doesn't come back. I do not I I don't th- I don't feel like it's a guarantee that he's a rental. A lot of people are, are feeling that way based on what's going on. I think by Nick Casario showing good faith and converting that contract to give him the freedom to re-sign another contract to make more guaranteed money 
will be a boon in 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 some form or fashion. The fact that they took the three and a half million off of next year and moved it to this year to make his contract now a twenty two and a half million dollar deal, I think that bodes well for the Texans going forward. If it's like them and Jacksonville or them and New England or them and whatever team you want to fill in there that needs a wide receiver that's going, oh, well, we'll give you $25 million. And the Texans are going, we'll give you twenty three, and and there's no state tax. <laughs> I don't know about I, – I, I don't know. But either way, I mean, I hope you're right. I hope that, that it plays out where he wants to come back and, you know. That would be amazing, but I'm not. I'm not holding my breath. I'll go ahead and come back to this episode a year from now when you know Stefan Dick signs a, a three year retire as a Texan deal uh, to stay here at a huge discount. But I, I'm I'm just not. I'm not super hope. I I don't want to say I'm not hopeful. I'm not. I I am an optimistic person, but that's not something I'm super optimistic will happen. But I yeah I guess that's it. We're um. Thanks for tuning in, staying with us. Um, I just started a Facebook page for the bullpen, and my goal is is to try and target that audience now with this stellar Texans talk. So if you are a Facebook person, you can look us up on there. Um, there's no posts yet, but there will be. So make sure you're you're tuning into that if that's your speed. Um, I am James Roy. You can find me at M1 Texans fan on all social media, um, and Tom is on Instagram. That's how I always lead Tom now is that he TC Tom one on Instagram, public profile, ready to be followed. You know, and it does the Astro stuff along with the Texan stuff. So, and I mean, occasionally you might get some dynamo stuff who knows. So, I mean, yeah, give him a follow on there. He's third coast Tom on Twitter. You can follow him on, on there for some third coast Tom therapy, uh, which you'll need after you know the way the Astros season has been going so far so make sure you follow him on there and as always stay classy Houston and uh vamos Texans thanks for tuning into the bullpen a Texans podcast part of the fans first sports network please like comment subscribe and follow along for more Texans talk from the bullpen Take the hand up. Stroud. Looking. Stroud.